So we'll start the recording. All right, Phyllis. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some kind of conflict with the schedule having to do with the lab. I have a lot of conflicts with that. Okay. And, you know, my schedule at night is, is difficult. Uh, is there going to be a video? Can I just watch that? I, yeah, that's very good you bring that up. Thank you. For everybody, um, if you didn't make it to lab, uh, or you can't, it, it's not obligatory or mandatory, it's optional. Um, I've made a video, it took took me an, a day and a half to edit that damn thing, so watch it. <laughs> but it's sort of study sessions, the way I structure it, where I go through That'll the be fine with Huh? That will be fine with me. Good. And I did get the caption on YouTube, but then I also just was able to caption it now before class and I put it through studio and then I put it behind the test review as a study session tab and I'll send it out on text and things like that. Did you guys, any anybody else watch that video yet? Was that a helpful concept, do you think? Yes, or? yes, I watched it. Okay. Anybody else? Any comments? Was that helpful or tips? Because I'm just starting to get into that. So I can use all tips that I can get. I confess, I only watched a little bit of it. I right. had trouble just keeping up with the homework for the week. Yeah, I know. And again, and these are all aids. They're not necessarily needed to be all watched. It's too much material because it's always the same kind of thing. But essentially, I want you to be able to, if you, you know, that's your personality or your learning style, you just watch these videos and you get the material massaged and talked about from a few different angles or a few different um, viewpoints. And with these study sessions, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring in some clinical stuff as well, especially with muscles and bones, which is sort of what I work with people all the time. And I've been seeing, you know, with these chronic things, many, many patterns. And so I can at least talk about it, to, you know, that, that makes it maybe a little more palpable for you guys as well of, of what, what means and what, what muscle means what. As we now get into the muscle. So with that, how, how are you guys doing with this bone stuff? You know, somebody else wrote in the... Uh on the padlet about the the uh, hip and the pelvis that's probably the most confusing bone to me as well as just is just sort of understanding all the attachment points and all of the reference points and and whatnot yeah, it's yeah, yeah. pretty hard to visualize yeah it's my favorite bone <laughs> <laughs> no i mean clinically speaking let me see if i can find that thing that's in the appendicular skeleton right um clinically speaking um it's a fascinating bone and and it's it's or joint complex really is what it is and it's um and it's very very important whenever i have issues neck pain shoulder pain back pain if that hip bone is not aligned proper or the muscles on one side in the back the glutes are too tight and the other and 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 that causes all kind of problems. So that's always the first go to for me, um, from a clinical perspective. But let me just share my screen, and then we can talk about these attachment bones, and joint things. Can you see my screen? Yeah. All right, we'll go right to the pelvis. Where is my pelvis? The Elvis was the pelvis. There we go. Um. Was it just, where are we here, Mr. Pelvis? We do have a lot of attachment points there, huh? Um, anything that sticks out as complicated from you guys' end, or shall I just go through the terms briefly and we'll pick them up? What do you think, Jeff? Jeff? Um, let's just go through it again. I think it was between the interior, posterior view, and then there was the it was hard to distinguish. Yeah, when we got into these views, it was hard to understand whether it was left side, right side, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. posterior, anterior. Yeah, let me. Yeah, the one thing that I at some point I need to add on here, which is my mistake, is I don't have a posterior view really, but I have the anterior view. So you're looking at the pelvis from the front here. 
um and so the the uh, uh the, the the thing here the crests the iliac crests right here actually that thing should be black not white the iliac crest here is sort of where the baby sits on so on the hip when you hold something on the hip you can rest it on that and then if you reach that to the front you go to the front so that's that iliac crest right here and you go to the front and you have a, a tip, a point that's pretty edgy in the front of your, uh, by the stomach, right there by the by the by the groin area. You can touch it uh, on yourself. The bone is right underneath the skin, and that's the anterior superior iliac spine. That's a complicated name. Um, um, if we have an inferior one here, another bump sticking out. We don't really touch on that in terms of the list. So that's why we have a superior. Uh, one anterior means it's in the front and then the iliac spine um, the spine is sort of a little weird name it's kind of from the crest type I think discussion when they visualized it originally the anatomists and this, uh, but this, it's the, this is the medial side no this is the, from the outside looking from oh. the outside in okay so see here this indentation here yeah that's the hip joint Okay, That's where the femur fits into the into the um, into the hip joint, into the hip itself. What I like about this picture is it has the colors of all the three bones that make up the pelvis. So you have three original bones that make up the pelvis. You have the main one is the ilium, where we have all these terms. When you say iliac, you know it's in this bone here. And then we got the backbone, which is the sit bone. This big thing here is the sit bone, the thing that we should sit on when we actually sit straight. And that big bump in the back underneath the glutes by our butt. And that's the ischium. See here, ischium. And you see uh, all these terms that has ischium, ischial in it, are pertaining to this backbone here. In us, when we look at the pelvis bone, it's not colored, it's just one bone. But when you look at the model, in a baby, the high the, the cartilage model, it is the three bones that then fuse together. And so technically speaking, they call this a joint, actually. If you go to the you know joints hierarchy, what is what? It's just an immovable joint. And so for our purposes, it's like just confusing. But we do want to keep in mind that they were three original bones. And then the front bone is where we have the pubic bone. That's the front in our groin right underneath the stomach. That bone there is the pubic symphysis. You see that here real nice. This bone here is the pubic symphysis. I think that's that's a joint. The symphysis is actually a joint, but that's um, the pubic bone in the front um, is, 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 yeah, see here, you see the three bones uh, labeled. So that anything here in the front is the pubic bone. You don't have too much going on in the pubic bone. A lot of, a lot of muscle attachments. All right there, like the muscles that come from the inner thigh that are the adductors, we'll talk about those. They go partly to the front of the arch and then partly to the back of the arch. And so to stabilize the, the leg coming from the outside inward, a little front and back. We'll talk about those biomechanics when we get to the muscles. So the front, so the iliac crest is this ridge here where the baby can sit in. The front bump, is the ASIS, I just use the abbreviations after a while, anterior superior iliac spine. And then if you reach to the back, you got a big bump in the back. And that big bump in the back, when you palpate it or on the model, you see it um, um, really sticking up. It's this blunt sort of thing, like the size of a thumb almost. And that's the posterior superior iliac spine or PSIS. So it's the front, the back bump is posterior, the front bump is anterior. And the thing, the crest is on top. Let's see if we got, are you, for lack of me not having a better picture today here, tonight in the lab, I'll show it on the model and then make a video of it. But this is a view from the back. You see the spine comes down, these little things here are the spinous processes. They come down and then the bottom of the spine is the sacrum. And that sits right in here. And then, then that bump, that big bump I was talking about is right here on the side. So that makes then the sacroiliac joint, which is a really, really big deal 
when you look at biomechanics. Because the bottom of the spine, if that thing is anywhere crooked, this whole spine is in sort of in, in bad shape or in trouble. Um, but the interesting thing about the joints are, when you look at the namings, is sacrum ilium that makes the joint. We call that the sacroiliac joint. So I want to bring that up as many times as I can because we don't talk too much about joints in this class, but the naming of joints is by using the names of both bones that come together. And they're pretty consistent with that. You see TMJ, temporal mandibular joint, or you see it, AC, acromial clavicular joint. There it's not the it's not called scapular clavicular joint, it's called acromial, which is part of the shoulder blade that that clavicle comes together. So I uh, just wanted to have that be a side note. So that gives you a few other terms there. Then we have, does that make some sense, everyone? Somebody? Yeah. Not that I just talk into the universe. Yeah, this was the most helpful. Okay, so that's good. So then, uh, and let me just, maybe I should just get a, darn little posterior picture as well let me just get one here. sorry sorry i was not prepared on that one ah what am i doing sorry. no let's tell this let's see what we get here real quick Yeah, you see here, that bump here, then the sacrum here, and that's the other bump, that's the posterior superiliac spine right in here. Um, and then when we come from the side, now I have to figure out where I was here and which tab was I in. Uh-oh. What am I doing? There we go. Um, so then when we go back to the lists, the next term we have there is the greater sciatic notch. That's also one. And the greater sciatic notch um, is right underneath the posterior superior iliac spine and then the inferior bump. But it goes, it goes, it's an indentation that's pretty deep. And I, I leave it on the list. It's a little harder to do this one on the online, on the Zoom. In the classroom, when you have the models in your hand, it's really a big bump that you can visualize and feel. Um, and the other thing is clinically is where the sciatic nerve comes out. And the sciatic nerves or goes through. And the sciatic nerve is, a, is, a, is, the, is about as thick of a thumb as a nerve is. It's, it's flat. It's not, a, it's not round, but it's really wide. And it goes through the butt area into the back of the leg and feeds all the stuff in the back of the leg down to the foot. Um, and it's often impacted as in we have back pain. See, people say we have sciatica, which, which really means the nerve is irritated and we want to have symptomatology below the knee. Um, but a lot of times people say it because they, you know, it, it sounds more and more, People often don't take back pain seriously. And so, you know, then sometimes uh, the patients use that word to make like, you know, it really hurts. But technically speaking, it's the sciatic nerve is irritated and it goes through this notch. And it's either often a disc, like a low back problem that irritates that nerve, but also it clinically is very much this muscle here that crosses from the sacrum out to the big bump on the thigh, which is the greater trochanter, and the nerve goes right through it. It's the piriformis. And that's another cause of that nerve being irritated. And when you look at how to fix it and what to do with it, this is so much easier because you just stick your thumb in or your elbow in and, and work the trigger points around it and loosen up that, that muscle as much as possible. And then that problem sort of dissipates. Um, so it's we, when we talk about the, the the lower leg muscles in a couple of weeks, we go deeper into that. Um, but that's why I have that sciatic notch on there. And then going further down the list, then we have the acetabulum. So again, here's the sciatic notch. Then we got the acetabulum, and that's the the whole sort of the the deep fossa, the deep indentation on the side of the hip, which is where then the femur goes in. 
the hip itself goes into that acetabulum, into the hip socket. So the acetabulum is the hip socket. Um, so that's important. What's interesting too is that this is a place where all the three bones that make up the hip meet together. So the force distribution is, is uh, interesting that way. Then we got the iliac fossa. And the iliac fossa is the front here of the, um, the hip, sort of um, like where the baby sits in if, if you're pregnant, like, like the hip um, um, fossa is in the front. It sort of like creates this basin, like this shallow basin type thing that can cradle the baby, but also, of course, is a great place clinically for having muscle attachments in here. Um, and I use it in the terminology uh, also as one because we have the hip flexor muscles attached here. And the hip flexor muscles are the ones that lift the leg up from the front, not the knee, that the thigh, lift the thigh up. And it often creates problems because we're sitting a lot and the hip flexors are shortened when we sit and they glue together and and get um, knotted up and so i i one of those hip flexors one well, a very big one is attached into this fossa so if i have back pain i always go right into this muscle is a little you know you got to be gentle because people are like why are you you know they are ten sensitive in that area but it's a very very important player and so the iliac fossa is where that muscle then the muscle would be called iliacus and some of you maybe have heard of the muscle name iliopsoas. Um, that's two muscles together that we will talk. Those are both of the hip flexors combined. The iliacus is in this fossa, iliac fossa. See the terminology. And then the psoas is one that goes up to the spine. And we'll talk about that next couple of weeks down. That clear or questions of that? Anyone? Please don't leave me alone. <laughs> Much clearer. All right, good. And then we already <laughs> briefly mentioned the ischial tuberosity. That's the sit bone. Ischial tuberosity. That's the sit bone. Interesting about the sit bone, you got a lot of muscles attached there. The muscles in the back of the thigh, the hamstring muscles, the hammies, when we do sports, we know about those. They're often tight. They go right into the sit bone here. And also muscles that come from the, when you look at the thigh, you have these muscles that go from the medial part. They're actually attached in the back, but they go towards the medial side, reaching into the middle part of the hip to bring that leg inward, to adduct is the terminology, that leg. And guess what? They're called adductors. So that's going to be nice when we do that because the terminology is right there. But we have a set of them that attach to the hip to the sit bone and then another set that attach to the front part and that's the last term on your list there under the second column the pubic symphysis that's the last um, term for the pelvis that we have and the pubic symphysis is right here this pubic bone here it's labeling is up here sorry pubic symphysis here we go pubic symphysis this here shows the difference between the, the pelvis is one of the places where anatomically male and female uh, um, um, anatomy is different. Um, and it's because of the baby carrying. And the, so the, the female pelvis is wider up here and, and, and cradles the baby more that way. And the male pelvis is narrower up here. Biomechanically, when we go into the back muscles, uh, the glutes, then that has a little bit of a change of how they're aligned. They're a little bit more in an angle here versus up and down on the male pelvis. And so we sometimes get a little more bursitis in the back glute muscles as we get older. Um, um, I've seen that, you know, very minor differences, but there's a little bit more tendency for that. Um, all right, that's the pelvis. You guys want to do the femur real quick? Or are you feeling all right with that? We can keep going if you're up for it. All right, I want a little more, and then maybe the maybe the scapula. How are you guys doing with the scapula? I did better with the scapula. Okay, good, because the scapula is also kind of a challenge. 
Oh, see here, I have that sciatic nerve picture and then that piriformis muscle that goes across and you see how it goes through it. So I put that picture up because I have this like hip stuff, hip pain things, uh, what can cause what. And and this can also cause uh, the hip pain. And then, and yeah, C bursitis is another one that can cause trouble. <clears throat> where's where's that bursitis that you're showing right there? It's so zoomed it's, in. Oh, that's, in a that's the yeah. I don't know where are we at. Why aren't we having the the? It looks like it's in that bursitis. area with the osteoarthritis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is the front. So this is that that psoas muscle that I talked about here. That's that muscle that goes in the front from the groin area in the front. Oh, yeah. To the inside of the thigh, right okay. up right up by the, in front of the sit bone. So it's really high up. See okay. here, this bump here? This bump here, that's the lesser trochanter right here. That's where actually this muscle goes in. That's the attachment point for that muscle. And what is the bursitis? What exactly is that? When you look at... Uh, let me see if I have it at the end. Do I have it at the end a little bit? No, I don't think so. A bursa is a is a. I have it in the joint chapter. A bursa is a is a sort of a, a a pillow inside muscle where we have friction. So you think you think like if you have a joint around the joint, you have a capsule that holds the whole joint together. It's very tough tissue a lot of collagen fibers, and you have a fluid inside, a synovial fluid. And that fluid creates an ability for uh, uh, the cap, the, the joint actually to move. Now what you can do is you can have this capsule without a joint in it. So you have a bag with fluid inside and that can, you can use that like a pillow. And when you move it and things rub on it, because there's fluid inside, there's no friction. So it's smooth and glidy. And so what we do sometimes in between muscles, we put it in between muscles where there's a lot of friction happening. And so that way it decreases the friction of these muscles. So you have some, a big one in the glutes, like on the side and the butt area. Um, that muscle, the gluteus medius, has a bursa underneath it. So it, create, it decreases the friction uh, of the two muscles, the medius and the minimus rubbing against each other. But if you have a lot of action happening or, uh, you know, you run crazy and you haven't practiced or things, it can inflame and can cause a bursitis. Every time when you see an itis at the end of the word, like bursitis, you know that's an inflammation. An itis is always an inflammation. And so the bursa can get hot so that it can get inflamed. And then we need to cool it down. But that takes time. And a lot of times, you know, you re people re irritate it. So it's a problem that stays around for a while, depending on how we treat it. That's sort of what I put on laser, for example, like to really try to, you know, help the healing process. So you can get that on the outside of the hip, like under the IT band. Yeah, right out here. Well, the IT band, no, more in the back of the butt. More in the back of the side of the butt is where the gluteus bursa is. And so a lot of times you can get it in there. So that's technically a bursitis. And so, yeah, and the challenge is you got to walk. And whenever you walk, in order for the hip not to, if you lift this leg, gravity will put this leg down, will pull it down. Or actually, if you hit, lift the other leg, uh, let me put a thing where I have two hips here. If you, if you lift, if you lift this leg up, this hip will fall down unless something holds it up against gravity. And what holds it up is this muscle over here that's attached on the back and the side of the hip, the pelvis, and reaches into the big bump on the outside of the femur, which is the greater trochanter. And, and when you lift this leg up, in order, like if you see if people waddle, like when the hip falls down a little and they walk, then this muscle on the side doesn't work so well because it's supposed to contract and hold the hip level and stable. Otherwise you have way too much action happening in his hip joint and over, the, over time that wears out the hip joint. But if you do like, let's say you run and you have a lot of force going on that gluteus medius all the time, that's when we get the bursa that inflames and then we get this bursitis as a potential problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. <laughs> well, we'll be talking to 
We could talk. And when I see the class. skeleton later, then I'll get a chance to really put it all all together. Yeah, we'll we'll talk. We'll bring it back. Looking at it in pieces is great, but putting it together as one whole process that's definitely hard. makes yeah. the you know connections. No, no, that's hard, and we'll look at it in in class again, and we'll help bring it up again so I can put it on the skeleton. Um, okay. Uh, show you guys. Okay, but then when we look at the femur. You know, we got a, a thing that's round here. That's a round thing in a moss in a bone. It's pretty much always called a head. So you know, that's a good guess if you if you have to guess it. And then guess what? Underneath the head, we got a neck. So in a in a in a bones, that often underneath the head is a neck. They weren't that creative with the thinking, which is kind of helpful for us. And then we got on the femur, proximally on the hip side, we got that big bump on the outside. That's the greater trochanter, the big bump. Trochanter is a word for a big bump. And a big bump, you always think muscle attachment. First thing you go for is muscle attachment. Um, and then on the inside, we have this smaller bump, and we, that's the lesser trochanter. And by the way, we have the same up in the humerus. We just call it greater and lesser tubercle and not trochanter. But if you go to the humerus, let me go up to the humerus real quick. Because these are very similar. And so you can, you know, conceptually visualize it. The humerus has a head too. It's also got a neck. And then it got a bump on the outside. Where is that thing? Here's the bump. A bigger bump on the outside and a smaller bump on the inside. The bigger bump is now called the greater trochanter. Now it's called the greater tubercle. A tubercle is a bump that's not as big as a trochanter. It's a little smaller. Yeah, it's, on the humerus, it's a little smaller. Um, um, and so that's where we find these similarities. And again, on the humerus too, bumps are muscle attachments. These bumps here are the ones that anchor the, the arm, the, the humerus into the shoulder blade. And we call them the rotator cuff. If you ever had heard of a rotator cuff tear or frozen shoulder or stuff like that, those are the muscles that are involved. And we'll talk about those when we group the muscles together next week. No, the week after that, I think. No, you guys, this week are going through it, right? Um, all right, to finish up the femur, where was it? Here. Then in the midsection of the femur, the only term I wanted to know is in the backside, known as the linea aspera, and that's a roughage. And when you feel a roughage like that, again, you think muscle attachments. Any, nothing else will go in. And, and if, it, if it doesn't need anything, it wouldn't be rough, it'd be smooth because the body, you know, probably can have, a, it's easier for the body to deal with a smooth bone than a rough bone. So this back here is the muscle attachments for actually all the muscles that are the adductors that we talked briefly. These ones that go towards the midline, holding the leg medially together. And then also the quads, which are the muscles in the front of the thigh, they are actually wrap. They are attached back here and then wrap around the front, and so that's kind of cool, clinically speaking. So I always bring that one up, and then from there, all we do is we go inferiorly towards the knee, and we got these big. You see better when you look from the back. These big round bumps here, that then the knee sits on, or the femur sits on the knee. And they are called condyles. Big bumps that make a joint are condyles. So you got a condyle on the inside, you got one on the outside, medial and lateral condyles. And then in the front, we also have the patella, the kneecap. And the kneecap, what the kneecap does, it helps guide, glide, well, it glides, and it helps guide the motion of the knee bending, the quadricep motion. So we'll, bring that back up when we talk about the quads and that's known as the patellar surface the kneecap is the patella um i had a, pay, a student once her name was patella and she said she got so many offers from orthopedic you know medical supply companies because her name fits so well together <laughs> with the anatomy stuff so that was kind of fun anyway that's the femur and then the, towards the knee when we get into the knee joint you have, again, these two wide structures here. This is the front, and they make the joint with the femur, and we call them condyles again. We call them lateral and medial condyles again. So you have condyles on the femur, 
and you have condyles on the knee. And so the other term there by the, on the tibia that I want you to know is the tibial tuberosity. And that's the bump where the quads fit in. All the front muscles, the quadricep muscles, the, the front of the thigh muscles, they insert, they anchor into here. And then in the, in, the, in the leg, we have an extra bone on the outside. That's the fibula. That's mostly a stabilizing bone because you look at the force going down from the, you know, the body weight force goes straight through the ankle here, straight down through the, I have a thing. Yeah, I see the force comes straight down from the tibia into then the big sort of cube shaped bone see how it's cube shaped here it's known as the talus oh i cut it off here talus this should have a t on it talus you see that on the list and the other bone in the foot that i have on the list is the calcaneus and that's the heel bone in the back i put them in because also clinically we you know we can have plantar fasciitis which has to do with these bones here uh, dropping down because the foot has an arch here in the front, it has an arch this way, but it also has one this way. Uh, but if we twist our ankle, which we often do as people, we twist our ankle, mostly we twist it to the outside, then um, we, we, we sort of misplace this bone and the talus bone generally. And these ligaments on the outside, actually these ligaments here on the outside get a little torn or a little bit stretched. So that's why I put those two in. But finishing up the tibia and the fibula, I have the malleolus, and these are the bumps on the outside of the ankle. You probably, if you bicycle as a kid, you probably hit your medial malleolus once or twice when you try to pedal down too close to the, you know, um, the bar there, um, because the, these these are right underneath the skin, so they can hurt. But that's pretty much why I put those up there. Um, they are clinically not muscle attachments. They're really holding. They're really helping the foot sort of cradle the ankle and sort of fit in like that. Um, that way we have a little lateral stability from that, um, from those bones coming together that way. Okay, how is that? That was good. Learning anything a little bit? Yes, it's, it's helping me understand my own injuries and everyone else I know <laughs> that has <laughs> <Mine too>. injuries. <laughs> It brings everything went, into perspective. I went to cross country skiing before, and when you started talking about the hip, I had um, some burning sensation in my left part of my hip, and that's because one, I was overweight, and two, my bones, like like you said, that that cartilage or joint in between the bones started to thin out in a way, yeah, to where yeah. I started burning. Yeah, and that's and if that that can be. That kind of pain, it can get into sharp, and then it's a, a real problem. Um, but it, that can be a bursa that's a little irritated, you know. And generally, if we just rest on it a day or so, we'll be fine. Correct. Yeah. So well, you know, cross country skiing too. You hiking up a a, a mountain. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I I I used to do randonnée, which is you put skin skins under the skis, hike up, and then ski down. And it's oh, really a lot of fun, but it's tough work. It's tough work. You, you move slow. <laughs> Very <laughs> so how is the upper, how are the upper bones for you guys? Any questions on those? Anybody? You want me to go through those a little bit or? Yeah. If you want to go through those, I, I wouldn't mind staying on. Okay. And I don't, I honestly feel like when you go through the different terms, it helps with pronunciation. That's the one thing I have with what's the um, the terms that we are learning is pronunciation. I love to hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, well that's good. I I guess they always say I like to speak, so we can we can go through because if we're looking at the the shoulder and we didn't even go through the axial skeleton, um, uh, which we can do, we'll, we'll definitely do tonight in lab, and then I make a video of it. Um, um, but if we're looking at this, the, the upper extremities, so we, we, we look at the shoulder and then the arm and then the forearm and then the wrist, hands complex. And the um, upper extremity have to be sort of, the arms have to be anchored onto the 
chest. And so when we look at the axial skeleton, and we got the spine, the bones going down in the back, we can feel those bumps, those are the spinous processes. And then in the midsection, we got the ribs coming out and they reach from the back to the front. And in the front, we have the breastbone that they come together and on some of them come from underneath and reach into it with cartilage. But then into that framework, we got to anchor the arm into. It. And we do that by having this flat bone, the shoulder blade, the scapula sort of lay onto the, um, onto the chest from the back where it's, you know, the inside is nice and smooth. And then we got a set of muscles that can anchor that into the chest. We got a muscle that comes around this like serrated looking, like a serrated knife looking muscle. That's the box, you see it in the boxers. When they push, you see these little fingers sticking up. That's a, a muscle. We got one in the front that goes into the chest that way. And then if we turn it around, we got a bunch of muscles in the back that hold the shoulder blade into the spine and into the neck. And to, so that's the anchoring component. The clavicle, the collarbone here doesn't really do much. I mean, it does, everything does something, but it, it mostly at, uh, pushes the shoulder blade back and holds it in place. It doesn't have too much motion. It has one muscle attached to. It is, however, the bone that breaks the easiest when we fall down with an outstretched arm. So it is, in children, the most frequently broken bone uh, because it's a flat bone. It's not that strong and it cracks easy. So that that can happen. <clears throat> I don't know if you any of you have experience with that. Um, but then we from there, now the shoulder blade is anchored. Then we can take the arm and just sort of stick the humerus and stick it into that, into that, you know, joint that gets created here and anchor then the humerus onto the shoulder blade. And so when we look at the shoulder blade, we've got multiple different areas that we want to point out from the back. And you can do this if you hold your, your, your back of your shoulder, you feel this ridge. And that ridge is the spine or the scapula. The, the shoulder blade's term is scapula, the technical term. And so that's a big landmark right here. If we follow those all the way to the jo to the outside where, the, where we can feel it fall off and then reach the next level, which is a little bit tender there, because that's the humerus that I'm touching here. But on all the way at the end, it's known as the acromion. So the spine or the scapula gets wider towards the outside, this towards the laterally, and we call that out that, that wider portion the acromion. And <clears throat> You, so uh, that's the upper outer tip of the shoulder? Yeah, so that's right out here, this part right on here. On the back side? Well, no, it's the top side. It's really flat on top. This reaches up towards the top, so it's it's pretty flat on the top. So the acromion, is that, uh, acromion, is that the top, is that the top of the shoulder that you would feel? The top or the tip of the shoulder, the outside tip of the shoulder, yes. Okay. When I didn't I realize that was attached it, to the back. Huh? I didn't realize that was attached to the back and not the arm. <laughs> well, yeah, the shoulder blade is attached to the trunk. And then we do have some muscles like the trapezius that then move the shoulder blade around too. Uh, um, and, and also the deltoid, then that moves the arm around. But generally speaking, that shoulder blade is anchored into the trunk. Um, the interesting thing about the acromion, which you probably have heard of, is you see, this is the acromion and you see the clavicle, the collarbone comes in the front. So the, the, the spine of the scapula goes to the back and then the, it wraps around the acromion and then it goes to the front in the clavicle. This joint here is often injured and that's an AC separation. And you probably, if you watch football or so, you probably heard of that, AC, acromioclavicular joint separation. So if somebody pushes down the tip of the shoulder, this can pop up and ligaments here can break. And so they have to then wire that shot or, you know, most of the time it doesn't pop all the way, it just loosens a little bit. And so I take my little hammers and push it back down or something like that. Um, anyway, that's the acromion. And then, and then when we look on top and on the bottom of the uh, spine of the scapula, we have fossas and fossas are indentations. So they're like, when you, when you touch the back of your shoulder blade, you feel that ridge. And then above that ridge, it goes down in the indentation. That's the fossa. That's, that term indentation is fossa. 
that's going to be a muscle attachment. So the one, the fossa above the spine of the scapula is known as the supraspinous fossa. The above the spine of the scapula fossa. The one below is known as the infraspinous fossa. And each of those have muscles attached to actually the rotator cuffs. We're going to have a muscle known as the supraspinatus. Ooh, look at that. Term is right here. We have one that's known as the infraspinatus. So the better you learn these terms, the easier the muscles will become to study. Because then you already have the terminology in the right arrangement. And then when we turn the shoulder blade upside down or inside out, we get the underlying, the underneath surface, which is smooth, and that goes against towards the ribs. So that was that's what anchors onto the ribs. And that's known as the sub, like submarine below scapula, subscapular fossa. So if you're laying face down, that's on the bottom part. And that has a muscle attached to the subscapularis muscle. Look at that. It's already there. The term's already there. And these muscles are huge. When I work this muscle on people, it's really hard to work because you are going underneath and it hurts. You have to be gentle and firm at the same time. But when people have shoulder pain, that stuff does the charm because people don't work it because it's a pain in the butt to work. So if I take my time and work it, five, 10 minutes, it changes people's, it's crazy sometimes what you can accomplish because you know people don't look at that because it's not convenient or it's you know a little bit weird and you have to talk to the patient. Anyway, that's that term. And then we have a couple more. We have the glenoid cavity. And the glenoid cavity, let's look from the side. See here, and you look from the outside in. So this shot here is like straight from the outside in taken laterally. You see here's the acromion. And then this shallow little depression is where the humerus sits in. So that's not like the acetabulum was like big and, and, and deep for the femur to sit in. The glenoid is shallow and the, the, the humor sits in shallow, not has doesn't have that much um, um, protection, bony protection. You do have a lip around like a, a, a top of her type cartilage that's known as the labrum and that sort of embraces it, but that gives the shoulder joint a lot of movement and you can move around, you can move that arm around. You can't move a hip around like that. There's too much bone around. And so that's glenoid cavities looks like just a little surface, but it's known as a cavity. Um, and then the last term is the coracoid process. And this is looking from the back and the coracoid process is in the front. So let's turn it around. So see here, it's looking from the front. So if you're looking from the front straight at the shoulder, right on the outside, not quite the outside. Now we're in the front, a little bit into the outside, there's a bump. And if you push on that bump, it hurts. It's right here. So my outside is right here. And then I go in a little bit and there's the next bump. And that bump is the coracoid process and it's muscle attachments. The process again, mostly muscle attachments. So you got multiple, you got muscles going from there to the chest on the inside. And then you got muscles from there going to the arm. Um, actually the biceps, you guys know about the biceps. That's the big one in the front. That's attached there too. And to remember that, term is really a weird name i'm i think of like a raven sitting on top of the witch and going like coracoid coracoid and so that's how i always remember that darn little term it's one of those goofy terms that doesn't fit in um so that's the shoulder blade and then from there the humerus is not that much different than a femur we got the head we got two bumps greater and lesser tubercle and now here we got actually we got in between the bump we named that we got an intertubercular groove or sulcus. When I first came to America and I did massage school, they talked, this lady talked about the inner tubercular groove. And I'm like, groove? That's in music. What is a groove? A groove is a music rhythm. I stuck up my hand, like 30 people in the class, like, ma'am, a groove, isn't that a thing in music, a term? And she's like, no, no, it has different meanings. <laughs> That's how I learned English. So <laughs> there you go. So I had to um, get a lot of laughter at those kind of things. But sulcus and groove are often interchangeable in anatomy. They use that. This is actually where a tendon goes through, the bicipital tendon for the biceps, the big muscles. So that's why we learned that. Um, the interesting thing about the humerus here is we have two necks. We have an anatomical neck, which is right underneath the head. And then we also have a surgical neck. And the surgical neck 
is the one that more often breaks. That's where they do surgery on. So that's uh, why they call that neck too. The anatomical neck is just what's right underneath the head. So that's the you know proper terminology and sequence because you got the head, the neck, and then these bumps. And now it's just, they made a surgical neck underneath the bumps because it just breaks easy there. Then we got the deltoid tuberosity, I believe you wanted to study. Yeah, so instead of linea spera here on the on the mid shaft, on the outside, you got a little roughage. You can feel it. If you push hard, it hurts. You go across it. And that's a muscle attachment for the deltoid muscle, which goes around on the outside, um, the shoulder. Um, and so that's known as the deltoid tuberosity. So we want to know that because we have a muscle going on top. Again, something rough like that, probably, probably a muscle attachment. So is that tuberosity, is that just like a little bump out or is that? Yeah, normal? it's just a little roughage. Okay. Like right, right here on the, 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 the muscle on the outside of the shoulder, um, they comes together and you can feel it sort of like it, when you rub over it, it kind of hurts a little bit. So it's not like a bump, like the, two, the you know, like the, the greater trochanter type thing. Um, it's a much smaller one. I know it took me a while to really get that when I started first. And then as we get this- Is that on the front outside? Yeah, outside, outside. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, see, I don't know. I don't know why they do the mirror image here. It's this arm really that comes down here. Yeah, that's slightly confusing with some of the images. <laughs> Cause I was like, wait a second, am I looking at this the wrong way? Yeah, I know, I just know it was like that. You know, they often do, like, I don't know if those people aren't, like, dyslexic. I'm dyslexic. So it's like the left and right, it's always a challenge. Yeah, it's already making it twice as hard because I was assuming, like, okay, is the bone shaped that way? Because it looks like it should be the other arm. Yeah, so but... let, me, let me orient. <laughs> so this is actually, the, this is, see here, anterior from okay. the front. So this is the view from the front. So if you look from the front, you got, on the outside, you got that tubercle. And then the other one, the small one, is more in the front. And then the deltoid tuberosity is really right on the outside. Mm, okay. And then as we get distally, you know, in the knee, we call it we call it um, uh, we call it condyle. Here they have different names for these things that make a joint. We're not going to study these names; it's too complicated. Capitulum and trochlea. What I want you to study is if you go with your hand and you follow down to the elbow, you have these little bumps on the inside. The one on the inside, you probably hit a few times because that's the funny bone, where the funny bone is. And that funny bone is where we have this part here. And that's right underneath the skin. And that's known as the medial epicondyle. And see, now the terminology comes back. In the knee, we have the condyle, which technically is this part that here they call the trochlea. Don't study that. But we keep the term epicondyle and that term condyle is here epi means above something so if you see the word epi it always means above something or towards the outside of something like in when we look at muscle we have a wrapping on the outside of the muscle they call that the epimesium in the heart they call it the epicardium so the term epi means wrapping means on the outside so in so this, that that is the inner elbow. That's the inner, that's the inner elbow. Upper bone. El okay, the inner above elbow the bone. elbow. Yeah, right there. It's still, yeah, the upper arm, the arm bone, right there. And 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 why we study that is because you have all the muscles, not all of them, but the majority of the muscles, they go on the forearm. The forearm muscles are attached here, and then they go to the forearm towards the wrist. So that's why we study that. And then we have an external one. We have a medial one and we have a lateral one. So now we look from the back. This picture is, don't cross this out. I should take this out. This is from the back. See here, medial inside. The medial is always where the head is. So you can orient yourself. The head goes medial. So the medial epicondyl is here. But then we have one on the outside known as the lateral epicondyl. And the lateral epicondyl is all the muscle attachments that are on the upper side. So the medial goes to the inside muscles the forearm muscles, and the lateral epicondyl is for the muscles that go on the outer side of the forearm. So that's good to sort of conceptually start understanding that a little bit because the forearm muscles are probably the hardest muscles we're gonna study in terms of what's what. And then the last bump here on the 
humorous, we're still in the humorous, is the olecranon fossa. And the term olecranon I use because if you look at the forearm, these are the forearm bones. We have the ulna and the radius. And if you stretch out your arm and you have your thumb go to the outside, the ulna is the one that goes to the pinky. And the radius goes to the thumb. So the radius always goes to the thumb. The thing is, if you turn your palm downward, these two cross over. Where do I see here? They cross over like that. So that's one reason, the main reason, that's the reason why the anatomical position we started in the first chapter is palms forward or palms up. So these bones are parallel. So when we describe things, we can describe, we don't have to go crosswise and sideways and it's too complicated. So we can just describe them as parallel bones. Anyway, so when we look at the ulna here and we look at the back part, we look at this view, this is from the side. You see this big ratchet, I don't know, ranch type thing that like goes around and can hold something. That's your electron own process. And on your body, that's the elbow. If you sit, if you put your elbow on the table, that's the elbow proper is this process, this electron on process. And it grabs this whole, this thing grabs the humerus and wraps around here. And this here is the back part of the humerus at the elbow where this electron on process fits in and that's why when you straighten out your elbow it is straight you ain't gonna go straighter than straight if you want to go straighter than straight you got to break this process don't do it because then you gotta wire it back and that's a pain in the butt this just reminds me of looking at like the cartilage on chicken bones you know <laughs> oh dear, no that, i mean it, <clears throat> then, then that stuff becomes interesting you should have seen me when i <laughs> i used to show my kids look here's a chicken heart let looks like it's ch chambers and my wife was like, oh, can you stop doing that? <laughs> anyway, so that's the, the terminology there, I think, because other than, other, oh, on the radius, we have a few we need to learn. We have a round thing here, it's called a head. And then we got a narrower part. This round thing is a flat round thing. And then we got a narrow part, that's the neck. And then we got a, a bump. And the bump is known as the radial tuberosity. We want to know that because, again, it's a muscle attachment. When we study muscle, the interesting thing clinically about this is this is if if you dislocate the radius, there's a ligament around called a, a annular ligament goes around here, holds the neck inward, and then the radius rotates because it has to turn somewhere to cross over. So it rotates up here, and this stays in place. Then this down here moves. But the problem is if you yank on your kid's arms and like come on we gotta go to the park or we gotta go home and you yank too hard this comes out and it slips from underneath and they call that the nursemaid's elbow because in the old days it's like you know the nurse's maid i guess would be yanking the kids around because they all take care of the kids i saw one of those in my career the mom felt so bad uh, and apparently all they do is they take the, the the forearm, the wrist, and rotate it and push it up. And so it slowly comes back in. Um, but anyway, I just clinically, again, it's kind of, it was kind of an interesting one. We don't see it too often these days. Again, I saw one in 20 years. Um, but that's um, what we learn up here. And then distally, we really have these two malleoli in the ankle. It was malleolus. Here it's the styloid process because the wrist is so much more pointy, but we have we have these edges at the end of these forearm bones that go down and out a little bit. So then the wrist can be embraced and held in place there. Because when we look at the wrist bones, we really have, you see here, the stylus is here and then one is here. And sort of it makes a shallow depression that then the wrist bones, we have two rows of wrist bones, one here and then one here, and they can be sort of, you know, held. Well, they don't held in place by it, but the motion goes that up here. We can turn the wrist this way. And then um, further down the second row, we sort of start bending it more flexion extension type bending. I'm not going to make you study all these terms. Don't worry about that. But it's good to kind of know that we got these two rows and what happens clinically. 
And then, and then the web of the hand is known as metacarpals. So the wrist bones are known as carpals. The, the ankle bones, I didn't say that, they were known as tarsals. So carpals is the wrist, tarsals is the ankle. And then the bones that make up the web of the hand, these are the metacarpals, we've got five of them. And then the, the, um, the finger bones are known as the phalanges. And what's interesting there is the thumb has only two, so you can only bend the thumb this way. The rest of the finger has three bones, so you have two joints. You have one here and then one here. Even the pinky has three joints. And so these are just called phalanges, and we call them proximal for, proximal is closer to the attachment towards the body, and then distal is further away from the attachments. Proximal and distal we use in the extremities mostly. All right, jeez. You guys are still here with me, and I'm just talking away. Listen, right? and I'm I, I'm listening okay, <laughs> intently. <laughs> I'm uh, taking good. screenshots. Don't worry, I'm writing notes. <laughs> okay, okay. So it's not too boring. So then we're good. So um, I I think when stuff is interesting to you, it'll never be boring. This this stuff is cool. If you well, ask me, I'm totally intrigued. Well, and I'm also, you know, now that I've been in, in, in practice a long time and I've seen a lot of different things and I've been allowed to work with the medical doctors early on. So I've seen a lot of those things. And it's, as we go through the anatomy, it's important to point out what's what, because it's really important for us to understand our body and chronic pain and neck pain and back pain or carpal tunnel or flannel fasciitis or all these things. We They, they are common daily problems. And and not all... to mention the stuff that is hereditary for us to get. Oh. You know, was, what comes back to mind was so interesting. I had these two patients and they were both in the podiatry school at Samuel Merritt. And they wrote a paper about plantar fasciitis. And I worked on their plantar fasciitis with my methodology, with my hammers and things like that, pushing these bones around a little. And they got help. And I'm like, did it help? You know, next time. Yeah, well, yeah, it was really better. And, are you putting that methodology in your studies and like, oh no, it's, there's no research on that. <laughs> but it's just applied anatomy and we've been doing it for a long time. It's just not right. necessarily the medical mainstream. And, and, and we need to know that. People have a right to know those things. And it makes it more interesting too. Anyway, so this week, if there's no other skeletal questions and if there I is- I have one more, just a clarifying yeah, question. Absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> Is the a tuberosity, that's where a, um, is that where you said the, uh, did you say the ligaments were attached? Or no, is it muscles? Tubercle, tuberosity, trochanter, trochlea, those things. Well, not trochlea, uh, trochanter, um, um, tubercle. Those are muscle attachments. Muscle attachments, okay. So, so, so the muscle, you know, at the, the middle part of the muscle is red. That's sort of the meat of the muscle. That's what contracts. We'll talk about that this week. Uh, this week, you're going to talk about muscle function a little bit. So we'll have a session that I want you to take some time to go deeper in that. And we can talk about then that yeah. next week. But then the ends of the muscle is where the white is. That's why it's, it, it, it can be ligaments or it can be tendons. And the white stuff is a lot of collagen fibers. Like you're thinking ropes, you're thinking cables that anchor the muscle into the bone. And if it's a muscle to bone attachment, it's called a tendon. And if it's a bone to bone connection, it will be called a ligament. But structurally, they're very, very similar. That makes sense? Okay, so muscle to bone is a tendon and bone to bone is a mm -hmm. ligament? Mm -hmm. Okay. I know you weren't quite asking that, but I figured it's important. To no, do. thank you. That's really helpful. Because that took me a long time and nobody really explained it in, in, in when I started. It's one of those that helps to understand that. So if you must. No, that was a super simplified, easy to understand answer. <laughs> you know, that's we, that's the problem with education. We supposed to, there's a, a saying up at school, uh, one of the tiles that from Einstein says, you know, you want to explain things simple, but not simpler than that. So, so you can you, to, for me, we just. Really ex understandable, but make sure you tell the whole story, you know. So where, where you said radial tuberosity, what would that be? A, 
a muscle oh, on the, on the, the bone on the, attachment? Yeah, you know which bone actually muscle attached there? So if you're looking at the radial tuberosity, you're looking at the thumb side. Whoops. The thumb side bone, that's the radius. So it's right in here. And the muscle that attaches it. Wait, there, we can't see it. We can't oh. see it. Are you oh, we're on the let um, let module get, screen? Uh, let me get the model back. Oh, yeah, you can't see me. Hold on. Let me get out of this. So on your on your own self, the thumb th side is where the radius goes. So that's here. The radial tuberosity is right up here at the elbow end. And the muscle that goes into it, the biceps brachii, the big muscle that people show off in the front when they make the curl. And that mm -hmm. goes up there. And when that when the arm is turned downward, that radial tuberosity reaches underneath and then the muscle wraps around. And when it contracts, it turns the arm hand back up. So it supinates the hand. And so that's so, why that's an important one. Let me show you on the model real quick. So you is the radial tuberosity considered a muscle to bone a tendon attachment? Uh, yeah, the radial tuberosity right here is where where I have the elbow. Is where if you look at the front of the elbow, here's where the where the biceps comes down, and then it reaches right into here. So that's a tendon attachment. A tendon you, attachment. You, 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 these bumps mostly are for us are tendons where it goes into um, the 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 ligaments. Um, the ligaments attach right around the joints more. And so I I point out mostly the bumps for the tendons because we then lay the muscles on top. We don't really go too much into the different ligaments in this section, in this class. Okay. But I put it in the booklets. I have it in the PowerPoints. And so, you know, if you're interested, there's certainly uh, ligaments that you can look at. And we can talk about it too, if you want, uh, more thoroughly. Okay. okay. So to finish up this week, you're going to do muscle function. So spend some time on that. And then we're going to start with the trunk muscles. And if you spend some time on that, then we can next week talk about talk about the trunk, the different trunk muscles and how they're layered a little bit. And, and sort of you guys have a framework. But if you work through the questions early on, if you, you know, the, the earlier we can do that in the week, the more integration time you have. And then the physiology doesn't have a color labeling, but uh, of course the trunk muscles has a colors and labelings exercise. So uh, uh, I go through um, go through that to solidify the terminology. A lot of this, what we do now is about different parts, what it is called. Traditionally, this is where we do a lot of memorization. But again, I'm more interested in you guys knowing, learning what something does and being able to apply it other than just memorizing a term. Um, so that's what we do there. Then we had a little ergonomic eval. I saw started reading some. Does that was that okay for you guys to do? Looking at your desk. <laughs> it's yeah, I figured it's mine's is mine's is horrible. I haven't even got to that part of the assignment yet. And okay. it's ridiculous. I um actually wanted to hold over after everyone um got off to speak to you about my yeah, new okay. apps. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, and these, these health integration, health kit, oh, uh, these health kit exercises are really here to integrate. So, you know, if, you, if you're uh, a little late on that, that don't worry about do that part. Um, this week, we'll talk about that ergo a little bit, and then we do a posture eval where I want you to go, you know, I, I actually go through the process of 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 really evaluating the posture, which which looking at which landmarks to look, and you take a picture or have somebody take a picture of you, and you evaluate your own posture a little bit. Look at mine there, when I was younger, <laughs> and then and then I have a video that's just four minutes that the PT does it, um, and then we do a few exercises because most of what we have we do more exercises most of posturally what we have is a head forward and so i want us to go through some stretches of of how to work the the neck bring the neck back a little and work the front muscles which are probably good for most of us to do um and then we have a few questions that i ask to have you reflect on uh what you learned and that way 
you get a little um, postural idea because now that we're finishing up the skeletal system and we get into the muscles, the trunk muscles, posture is a lot about standing in good posture has a lot to do with how easy it is for the muscles to be in gravity. Like if a head is on top of the shoulder, many less, my back neck muscles don't have to work that hard. If my neck is all forward, they have to work really hard to hold it up. That gives us pain. That also makes us fatigue. So it's good to think about those things a little bit as we walk through these um, terms. Um, but again, a lot of has to do with gravity. How am I, how am I in gravity? And that's uh, the postural thing. Good, good, good. All right. Any questions to that? Thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Oh, yeah, anytime. I like doing this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you later. All right, guys. If you come in the lab, come on the lab. It's tonight. Okay. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Uh, thank you. Bye.